Welcome to Short Talks from the Hill, a research podcast of the University of Arkansas. My name is Matt McGowan. Today I'm talking to Carl Drexler, Assistant Research Professor at the University of Arkansas and Station Archaeologist with the Arkansas Archaeological Survey. This past summer, Drexler led a major excavation of Caddo Mounds near Locksburg, a small community in southwest Arkansas, north of Texarkana. Locksburg has an interesting an infamous archaeological history, and Carl's going to tell us about that. Welcome, Carl, and thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Could you remind listeners of the role of the Arkansas Archaeological Survey? Why do we have this service? So we're a unit of the University of Arkansas system. We're headquartered here in Fayetteville, but we have uh, 10 research stations uh, scattered around the state. Mostly those are at other universities, so we have a couple of state parks uh, as well. Um, we do public outreach, things like talks, artifact identifications, uh, public friendly digs, research, uh, teaching for the both the U of A and host institutions. And we curate the vast majority of artifacts covering Arkansas's 12,000 years at least of human history. Um, we have this um, because back in the 1960s, a group of Arkansans from all across the state who were very passionate about our collective past and wanted to see it studied and preserved uh, worked with the U of A museum staff to set up the system and get it put in place by the state government. Um, it's one of the best systems of its kind in the country. Our colleagues tell us this uh, frequently, they're very jealous. And it's also a testament to the strengths of Arkansas's community connections, um, as there's, there was and is wide support across the state for getting this together and keeping it going. That's wonderful. Let's jump to this summer's project in southwest Arkansas. First, though, can you tell us about the Caddo people? Well, they lived uh, across most of western Arkansas, as well as eastern Oklahoma and uh, north Texas and Louisiana. Um, their ancestors had lived in the area for you know, literally thousands of years, but around 800 AD, they started uh, living in settlements and making things that show a shared culture um, with some local variations that we call the roots of modern Caddo culture. Uh, they're primarily farmers, but also some very uh, skilled traders. Uh, they live between basically the forests of the east and the Great Plains. Uh, so they uh, had some very strong connections uh, that they could leverage. Um, they dealt in salt. We'll talk about a little bit more about that later, um, but also bow wood and some other things. Uh, they live primarily in small hamlets and um, then would gather at larger mound centers to hold uh, important community ceremonies. And this way of life endured up until the 19th century when they were uh, pushed out of the state. They remain a distinct sovereign nation. It's about 6,000 uh, members of the tribe uh, currently. Capitals over in Bingham, Oklahoma. And much of what we do uh, in Arkansas dealing with the Caddo uh, involves working with their national government and some of their artists. And we're fortunate to be able to work with them and uh, study their history uh, in Arkansas together. Many people know about the Spyro Mound southwest of Fort Smith, but I think uh, very few people know about the mounds at Locksburg and then Holman Springs, but that's changing thanks to your work. What is the significance of Locksburg and Holman Springs? With Holman Springs, uh, we know that that was a salt making facility. Caddo's would use the brine from the marsh to make salt. Uh, they'd evaporate it in pots and then collect the crystals and they could use that to trade um, we think this is tied in part to the uh, growth of corn as a, a dietary staple. Uh, when you uh, s start eating more and more plant-based material, there's less sodium in that than there is in meat, and so you need as a dietary supplement. Um, and one of the things that makes Holman Springs really, really crucial is that there have only been a handful of cattle salt-making sites excavated ever, and only one or two that are as large as the excavations that have been done at Holman Springs. Um, so getting more and better data helps us better understand when salt was being made, what other things were going on in the cattle world in North America uh, more generally, and what this did for the cattos both within the tribe and in their relations uh, to others. Locksburg Mounds is a bit more of an enigma. It sits in the middle of the Little River Basin, 
uh, which is one of the least studied areas of Arkansas and the Caddo homeland. Um, the few things that have been written on the region actually don't even mention the site, um, which is weird because it's one of the largest sites in that region. It consists of about 13 mounds that we've been able to identify, um, mostly centered around a central platform mound, so sort of square topped, uh, likely had a, a, a temple built on it at one point. And we care about the count of mounds because we use this as a proxy for the significance and importance of the site. Um, big multiple mound centers like this would have been places of great power that would have brought people together from very far away for very important occasions. Knowing where the important places in a region are tells you a lot about the social complexity of society, the geographic range of people who look to those sites, and something of their beliefs and how they lived. Um, uh, not having Locksburg Mounds, this giant thing right in the middle of a cluster of smaller sites uh, that we already knew about in the area, very seriously skews how we understand cattle life during the period uh, when it was in operation. And the thing is, we're still trying to figure out when it was in operation. Not having artifacts or samples from the site, we really don't have a good database for teasing up the details of the place and the lives of the people uh, who built it. That's a perfect segue to my next question. I want to ask you um, what happened at Locksburg back in the 1980s. So our work is a lot easier if there's you know, data to recover, and this has been a big problem with Locksburg, uh, because back in the 80s, uh, some folks signed out a mining lease on the site. And this is akin to a mining lease uh, that we'd see for minerals or precious metals. But in this case, it was actually for Native American artifacts uh, to sell. This is a very industrialized uh, mining, looting operation, um, which creates a couple of issues. Uh, one, you know, we, uh, you know, we need to see what's coming out of a site to actually sort of, you know, know when the stuff dates to, uh, what kind of art is being uh, associated with that. Um, and so we, we lose that data when it, uh, it goes away. Um, but then also when people do bring us things and say, well, we found this at this site, we have to take their word for it. It's not a, a documented, uh, we call it in situ uh, recovery of an artifact where we can be sure of its uh, provenance. Um, we just, we, it introduces some error that makes our understanding shaky. Um, and for Locksburg, this has been a big problem. Uh, we know that for about five years, uh, the uh, looters tore into literally every mound on the site uh, with a backhoe. Um, so this was uh, incredibly damaging and disturbing. Um, and it was really immense industrialized uh, looting. And there were some archeologists who actually saw it happening because there was a public road that goes uh, used to go right through the site, and they would write about literally going going home shaking with a mixture of anger and sadness over what was being lost. Um, but they weren't allowed to go out and actually document or recover anything themselves. They didn't have permission to go out there. Well, this is the question I've been dying to ask, and I, I think that I'm probably going to be a little bit disappointed. What can you say about the, the uh, dig overall? Well, you know, with... One of the differences you get between archaeology and relic hunting is that the relic hunters are after the, the big, whole, complete, nice pots. Archaeologists like finding those too when, they're, when they uh, pop up, but we're also very interested in the little broken fragments of things. And we got you know, a, a good number of uh, small uh, pottery fragments, uh, some uh, stone arrow points, and one of the one of the things that I think really uh, vexed um, some of our volunteers was that a couple of the first items that actually popped up were uh, some 19th century English-made ceramics and some uh, iron nails, which I'm actually not surprised that we found those. Uh, uh, when you get people, farmers moving into an area, they want to tend to want to stay out of uh, the river valleys because they flood, and so a lot of those mounds have 19th century occupations on them, and sure enough, we found them. And we also, right in that same uh, same first couple days, uh, found about a four or five thousand year old spear point, not too far away. And this is a, a huge time gap to cover, um, 
but I was actually really happy to find that because what that what that four to five thousand year old spear point is is that was probably something that was buried in a much older uh, part of the site, and that as the caddos were pulling up dirt to make the mound, they found this point and it got worked into the the fill. When we probably would not have found that point without you know looking outside of the mound, which we just weren't going to do. And so what this tells us is that in addition to you know the probably five or six hundred year old caddo occupation, there's a four to five thousand year old call it archaic occupation on the site as well. So it gives us a much deeper understanding of the uh, history of the settlement of the site than the mounds that are real clear on the surface. Um, but as we, you know, we started off digging in the, you know, some of the areas that had been disturbed by the backhoes in the 1980s, and as we got underneath that, we were getting into undisturbed uh, mound fill, and we're finding uh, in situ uh, pieces of pottery, projectile points, and we also found a couple pieces of charcoal that are big enough that we can send those away to be carbon dated, which will give us an actual direct concrete understanding of when the site was occupied. And also the mound, as we uh, finish the excavation that we're doing this summer, you can see uh, construction layers in the mound itself it was built up in several different stages and having carbon samples from different layers will tell us when each one of those layers is put together because these things grow over over time. They usually, sure. they make one, there's generally a temple on top and that's burned at some point and then capped new and so they build up and we'll be able to get each one of those layers going up as we um, move forward with the analysis. Well, Carl, thank you for coming here today. I really appreciate your, your work and learning more about it and we look forward to hearing more about uh, this, this specific dig and, and others around the state in the future. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Music for Short Talks from the Hill was written and performed by local musician Ben Harris. For more information and additional podcasts, visit researchfrontiers.uark.edu, the home of research news at the University of Arkansas.